gamers? I'm Jason. I'm Julie. And today on Dice and Dragons, we are going to be journeying back to a world that I like. That's right, we are in the world of Andor. Now, Sammy G and I started by covering the legends of Andor, and now I get to introduce Julie to this wonderful setting. So we are going to be playing The Liberation of Rietberg, a game in the world of Andor, published by Cosmos Games and designed by Gerhard Hecht. Now, hopefully I pronounced that right. I know that it's not, uh, I believe it's a German name because that's where uh, Andor is from. Julie, mm -hmm. you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're right. All right. So I will now toss it over to Julie, who will tell you more about the game itself. So it's a cooperative game uh, that plays... Yay! <laughs> We've had a few competitive games lately. <laughs> two to four players. We're back to our roots. Uh, it's intended for ages uh, 10 and up and plays in about... 40 minutes according to the box, and I think that's pretty accurate. I think we played around the 45 minute mark. Yeah, no, definitely at that 40 minute to maybe an hour range. I think it went quicker because we were playing with just two players, even though we are controlling multiple characters. Now, just to give you an overview as to what is going on in the liberation of Rietberg, the game is set during the Legends of Andor, if I'm not mistaken, pre-Legend 5. So this is a nice side story if you're a fan of the game, you get uh, just a little bit more information about a specific event. And what you're doing is you arrive at the fortress. It has been taken over. There are six locations in the for fortress. I almost said forest there. And uh, you've got enemies that are very familiar to those that know the lore that are protecting these different tasks that you must complete. Now to beat the game, you must defeat the enemies or use other abilities to Get down to, so that there are no enemies covering your task. Reveal the task and complete four of them in order to liberate the fortress and help old King Brander. Well, I think I got all that right. So now, Julie, what time is it? Well, it's time to grab our drinks. Grab our best friend and fellow adventurer. And we're going to take it to the table one more time. Yeah, we're going to take it to the table one more time. Looking forward to playing this and then giving you our thoughts. Now let's take a look at the components for the liberation of Rietberg. Now we'll start with the rule book. As you can see, you get a nice breakdown of all the components. You do get a quick reference guide for the back of the rule book. It's not too long, not too much fancy stuff in the rule book, but it's definitely very clear. And Import, most importantly, if you're trying to find something, it's easy to locate. Now here we have some of the tokens for the game. We have the willpower tokens. We have Chata's quivers. So as you can see, each quiver has a different value. It's random, so you don't know what you're going to get when you draw them. You also have ER spell books. So as you can see here, it uh, ends up being upside down. Then we have different values. For example, you can get a movement, you can get strength. Now this green one's a little different than the regular strength ones because it means you can use it from any location on the board. We have the standees for all of our characters. Chata, Thorn, Yara, Orphan, Cram, and Kila. Now we'll take a look at their cards. So as you can see, strength, she can get quivers. This is revealing an encounter card and movement. You notice that it says or on all of them, meaning you can do one or the other and Chata cannot use willpower. Don't worry, we'll go through all of the uh, what these symbols mean. But for example, strength, that's the ability to remove a card, one movement and one willpower. So pretty cool stuff that Thorn can do. Yara, so spell books. As you can see here, she can play both spell books. That's related to the task cards, revealing a task. Characters can pick up a card. She also has a lot of cool things such as movement and reveal, or just a fair bit of movement. Next, we've got Orphan. Special ability is that he's got four cards. So you can see attack and move. This card is not that good, but it's still a card that you can play. Only two fight, but you can reveal an encounter card, one movement. He's got definitely a fair bit of variety. And this is sort of his special ability, which moves a face-up card to his location. 
So we've got cram. We also have his axe. So as you can see, when it's sharp, it's plus four. When it's not sharp, it gives you plus one. And you have to decide to use the axe the first time. When it's plus one, you can use it all the time. So as you can see, five strength plus whatever the axe is. You can take a look at cards or even shift some cards around. One movement, one willpower. Actually, I like this one, fighting and revealing. That's always fun. And then lastly, we've got Kila. As you can see, her strength, ability to swap cards, lots of movement so she can get the group all together, the ability to play her water spirit and reveal a card, high strength card as well, or she can get a weaker attack, but also bring the water spirit into play. So interesting stuff. As you can see, we've got the standees for all the characters. And just to show you, as you can see, the standees, they're not the same on both sides, which I do like. It's just a little bit of flavor, but it does make each of these characters feel like they are fully developed. Now you've got Keela's Water Spirit, which has two sides, so times two to her attack, or attack plus two for each hero that is at the location. We also have just some quick reference cards that you can use just instead of the rule book, so you wanna make sure to keep these nearby, they're useful. Now here, here we have the friend cards, these are different friends that will join you, they count as a hero card. We'll take a look at two of them. So we got Herald of the Shield Dwarfs, you may move one top down encounter card to your location. Vest the Archer of the Watchful Woods, you may turn over a quiver, quiver and Vest can fight with this battle strength that turn. Pretty cool. So. Lots of fun, different characters that can join you. Here we've got the encounter cards, which can range from scrawls, give you gold, gores, also give you gold. Some more dangerous cards, which will give you a special ability when you beat them. So for example, a player of your choice can pick up a card. And as you can see, we've got a large variety of different creatures. Trolls will let you get a friend card. And you may also find items like the bone branches, which you can pick up as a free action. So pretty cool stuff. Now we'll take a look at the narrator cards. So these will be the instructions as to how you're gonna be laying things out on the board. Don't worry, I haven't forgot about the board. So location of a face up card, location of a face down card. And as you can see, they are all identical, but they do have their own flavor text. So if you're into it, I recommend reading it. It just adds a nice, uh, little aspect to the game. It's not something that Julie and I were really into. Now we've got all the different task cards. We won't spoil them. We'll take a look at only two of them. So if you get one with blue text, got to do that first. The scroll rich means you must turn over the top narrator, narrator card in the narrator deck and carry out its instructions twice. Once you do that, you may acquire this card. Fire spirit, you must remove any tin creatures from your trophy gallery. Don't worry, we'll explain what that is. So you just get an idea as to what you need to do to complete tasks and win the game. And then we've got our board, which small board, but that works well. Space for narrator cards, space at the bottom for the friend cards, your locations, one, two, three, four, five, and six, and the tasks at each location. There you have it, these are the components for the liberation of Rietberg. Now keep it right here as we're gonna come back at you as we teach you how to set up the game, which will be followed by a how to play. Now we're gonna teach you how to set up the liberation of Rietberg. Now, you can see right here, you wanna stack up the willpower tokens. You don't have to place them on the board, but that's what's recommended. You also wanna split the quivers into roughly three equal stacks and mix them up as well to make sure that the draw is random. Now you'll need to take the task cards and just give them a quick shuffle. And you're gonna be dealing out six of the tasks and then you'll be returning the rest of them to the game box. So as you can see, we'll place them out on the board. Just trying to make sure nothing uh, slips off camera. Even if it moves the task out a little bit further in, does it really make that big of a difference? So we've got three, And we got the last three, we've got six. Now the rest of these will be returned to the game box. Now we'll take our starting heroes and we're doing the recommended 
heroes for the first game, which is Chada, Cram, Orphan, and Thorn. We're also going to need these encounter cards, which I'll keep near the deck. We need to shuffle the narrator cards, and we'll need a narrator card discard pile uh, for the purposes of this game. I'll probably have that be just off camera. I'll see once everything is finally set up. So we've got the narrator cards. We take the friend cards, shuffle them up. Thorn is clearly trying to make some friends, but got to defeat a troll to do that. We have Cram's battle axe item. We also have our reference cards, which we will place in a moment. Now that what we need to do is get these encounter cards dealt out. So to do that, we need to go to the narrator deck. We're going to deal out eight narrator cards because this is a four player setup. It is two cards per character. We then follow the instructions on the cards, which will say face up encounter card at four and a face up encounter card at one. So we put a face up encounter card here at four, put a face up encounter card here at one. Next, oh, I'm jumping ahead here. Let's reveal the card. Well, so don't forget, pull the narrator card first. This would be actually dealt face down, but that's cheating. I'll throw him actually, actually, you know what? Doesn't matter. I'm gonna keep this guy up here because it's a troll. It may let us show off the friend mechanic. So we get the first face down card going at six and a face down card going at two. Yeah, so I just made a mistake. Remember, narrator card first, then the encounter card. Now these discarded narrator cards, I'm just gonna place off camera. You'll need to keep them near the game board. There are some special abilities that will let you put them back at the top of the narrator deck. So let's draw the next one, a face up card on six. Now, if you're doing your first game, it does recommend to ignore the red. Red can also be ignored for an easier game. In this case, that's not what I'm doing. We're doing a regular setup, so we place a face down one on four. We draw the fourth card, a face up one on three. And we get a face down one on two. That makes it four cards. Here's the fifth one. Face down on two. Face down on three. So I'll try to make sure that you can still see the locations as that's relevant. So clean this up. The sixth card, face down on two. Face down on three. Seventh card, face up on five. So we got a troll. And face down on four. And our last card is a face up one on three, which is an item, which is pretty cool. And a face up card at the location of the heroes. So that automatically means six because that's where we are located. Now, I'm gonna take the encounter cards, I'm gonna move them off camera, because I'm only gonna need them when we have to revitalize our heroes. So don't worry, that will get explained. I will keep the reference cards here. So if we need to take a look at anything, I'll be able to explain them to you. Now the one thing I want to highlight is that I will not be going through all of these different symbols during the how to play. We're just gonna teach you how to play the game. To do that, we're gonna go through a full round of all four heroes. So we're gonna go until the point where people have to start revitalizing their cards. That's what I'm gonna call a full round. And then we'll discuss completing a task if that doesn't come up during those plays. So I will place each hero's hands out. So we'll start with Orphan, Thorn, Shada, I'll uh, place Cram's cards here. So we'll make sure that everything's nice and cleaned up, visible. I was just laying it out to get an idea. And I'll actually flip them over so that you can see what I have available in the hand of each character. And once I've played a card from a character's hand, it will be discarded off camera just to keep our playing space nice and neat. 
Now, there you have it. We've taken a look at how to set up the liberation of Rietberg. Now let's teach you how to play. Now, how do you play the liberation of Rietberg? Well, the basics of the game is fairly simple. What you're gonna be doing is playing a card from your hand. You may decide what action you're going to choose. So for example, you may use your four strength to fight and defeat a monster. You do that if your strength is equal to or greater than what they have listed here. You may play this second ability, which will give you one quiver, and in this case, let you flip over the top, and I stress the fact that it has to be a top, face down encounter card, or you can move for a total of three. Now, you may be wondering why you'd want to move three. This is just a good explanation, because you may spend one movement to move anywhere on this board. So for example, I can decide to play this for the first turn with Chata, move here. I have two other movement, it means I could bring everyone else that's at a location or even at another location with me. Well, not everyone, there's still Thorn, by using those other two movement points. Now, this is just an example. It's not what I'm gonna do for my actual turn. I'm gonna actually use the strength, but when you're at a location, you can acquire any items there as a free action. You can also reveal any task at a location with no more encounter cards as a free action. So that's just a quick explanation of movement. Now, when you're in combat, as I'm going to be with Chata, you may also ask other characters to play a card. They may join you in battle and it does not necessarily count as a turn, but the more you team up together, the faster you're gonna be cycling cards. Each character gets one play of a card per turn. So as this is very straightforward, just makes the most sense, Shadow will play this card. So I'll just put my active card here right now, just nice centered spot. So we do defeat the Gorlot and we actually, you know what, I'm gonna slide my cards over a little bit because we need to keep trophy piles. So there will be three piles of trophies, one for anything that has a gold symbol, one for the Flugors as it relates to a different task, and then one of anything with other abilities. So just keep that in mind. You wanna keep track of your different trophies. Also, when you defeat the Gorlot, you receive one gold, which is why it goes in the trophy pile, and you may perform one move. So that's perfect. So Chata will actually move to this location and as a free task, we'll pick up the telescope, which is then added to her hand. Now, once an item is used, it goes into the trophy pile. As this is a cooperative game, you get to decide the order that you want to fight in. So that's, the, that's an advantage. And one thing I did neglect to mention with a move, when you're playing a move, it's only if you've got extra movement that you can bring other characters with you. So you'll take a look at the Flugor. It has this symbol up here, which means its total strength is equal to the amount of face up character cards, well, encounter cards. So we have one at three, and I always count itself. So that's a total of two strengths, three strengths from the scroll, four from the troll, five, and six. So we have a total strength of six for this Flugor. Taking a look at what each hero has available to them. So uh, right now, Cram's Axe is sharp. Don't forget it always starts on the sharpened side. So this just makes way more sense than anything else. We remove the card that Chata played. We'll play Thorn's active card. He's gonna just hit this guy for six damage, take him out, add him to the pile, and it will that will have been his turn. And I'll take a look at our other heroes. Now, we do have Cram's card, which gives him six, plus the axe is sharpened axe if he chooses to use it, and he may reveal the top encounter card. So we're definitely gonna play this one because we get to execute that in the order. So we get to reveal the top encounter card, which is a troll. We can use our ax because it just makes more sense. We don't necessarily wanna team up. 
but that is something that is entirely viable, but we can do it. It's easy enough. So we team up, we defeat the troll, placing him in our third, and I'm just gonna move things over so he's not off camera, our third pile. And as you can see, Cram now receives a friend card. Trius, the fire warrior, you may pay one gold, then he will do the fighting for us this turn. That's pretty cool. That was a free action. We can reveal the task. So this is Earl the Bard. You must pay for each uncompleted task card, one gold for each face up task card and two gold for each face down task card. Now, this is a difficult task to complete. It's something that we could probably do later on, but as you can see, you don't have that many great options because we'd have to pay two, four, six, eight, ten to acquire it. So we'll have to come back to this at a later time. One thing to keep in mind is that as we revitalize our cards, we're gonna be drawing from the narrator deck, which is gonna hide this task. So this turn is now almost over. We essentially have Orphan that's left, and he's got his movement and five fight. Don't forget, we defeated a bunch of cards. This Flugor is rather weak. So he's actually going to spend his movement, go over here, defeat the Flugor, adding it to our second pile, and get a chance to reveal this task. So you may collectively take three objects from your hand and place them in the trophy gallery without using them. Well, he would have to have three objects, like the telescope, we'd have to throw them away in order to acquire the task. So, so far, nothing that's really to our benefit. Now. No monsters are gonna spawn. We haven't revitalized any of our cards yet. So we need to decide what we're going to do. Well, we wanna see what this task is. So it's a new round. Orphan's actually going to play. I'm gonna use the two movement here for his value. And sorry that I neglected to put his card <laughs> actually in play. I just put in the discard last time and I left Cram's cards out. So we'll take this. Wait, no, I cannot use this one. I left it out, my apologies. I had spent this one, that's why I got confused. So he's got his three, two, three, and three because they acquired people. All right, so we're back where we need to be. Now I'd like to move, reveal some stuff, maybe get a quiver for Chata. So he's got to move and reveal, so that's actually, or he's got to move in a fight, which isn't too bad. Maybe we want to team up with another character. But what do we want to do per se? Well, you know what, he's going to move and reveal. It'll show you this one. So we'll play Orphan's card. We're going to move. Let's see where we've got the least amount of enemies. Well, we know the Flugor here is actually not that dangerous. So let's actually move here because we have another hero. So maybe we'll want to do something together. So move there. We'll reveal the top card, which is Hadrian's Mirror, which we can acquire or leave it for another character to acquire. But free action is trading, so might as well just pick up the mirror and we'll actually give it to Chana because she can maybe be able to actually go complete that task. So that is his turn. Now we want to get further down. So I'm actually going to spend Thorn's special ability here, which lets us just get rid of an encounter card that's face down anywhere, get it out of the game. So we're going to do that, play this, boom, card goes out of the game, revealing just the Flugor that's there. I'll have to take a look and see what we have, not many great things that we want to do, but I'd like to be able to maybe get that guy. Let's see what Shadow has. So we have an attack and a quiver. You know what, this guy's rather weak. It's, he's a value of one, two, three right now. Sorry, three, four. Oh, he's not one, two, he has a value of four. So we will go ahead and play Shot his card, so we'll draw a quiver. Hopefully it's a good one. So it's a six. 
So we can use this quiver. Once the quiver is used, it goes into the box to defeat this flugor, adding it to the stack. We have to reveal this task. You're allowed to have no more than four encounter cards at each of the six locations. So let's count. One, two, three, four. This one has three, this one has one. We have now completed our first task. So we can acquire the card. We no longer need to worry about the location. So I'll just take this off camera. So we're actually making some much better progress right now. And it's now Cram's turn and don't have too many great choices. I kind of want to stick to some strong attacks. So we'll play Cram's card. And, oh, actually, sorry, I just put it here. So we'll move one, reveal one, see what we get. So we get a fairly weak scroll. And now each character has played two cards and we haven't had to do a group battle as of yet. So things are going very well for us, but we'll probably need to do a group battle at some point. But I don't know if I'm going to showcase it. We might actually have to do it uh, later on. I'm just playing the game very naturally here. So we'll start with Cram because he's just in his location. So we'll do the five plus the axe. He's got a total fight of six. So we'll just get rid of Scrawl. So that's done. Now, not much for Thorn to do where he is. So we're going to play it. It's got to have him move to engage the troll. Chata has some good stuff. She can move one and gain a quiver. So we'll do that. So move one, gain a quiver. So her quiver will just sit here. And Orphan will move into position to potentially help somebody. And actually this will give us a chance to just sort of revitalize as we'll play one more turn and then we'll go into our review of the game. So that was his card. And as you can see, everyone is played. Now, one thing to be to point out, Chala can play these cards if she so chooses. Thorn can play this card. They do not need, sorry, not Thorn. Cram can play this card, so we will not need to revitalize his deck. And we did not go over what willpower is. I'll talk about that in just a second. Now, as Orphan's the only one that can play, we need to revitalize our decks. We got to get some cards back. So everyone is going to reset essentially, except for Orphan. So Thorn resets. We'll draw a card. We carry out the function, so we play a face down encounter card at one, meaning Chata can no longer complete the task without getting rid of that encounter card. We place a face down encounter card at five, so we no longer know what the troll is that's there, which is unfortunate. We then revitalize for Chata. So we place a face up encounter card at six. A face down goes at three. We will also now have Cram do his revitalization. So we draw our next narrator card, which is a face down at five and a face down one at the location of the hero. So everyone's revitalized. So now Orphan will play his last card to reveal the top card of the encounter deck, which now reveals a troll. And play would then start again. So we're going to just do a team battle here, and then I'm going to go to the review. As I said, we're not going to take a look at all of the aspects of the game. It's, as I said, fairly straightforward, and you can find that out in the rulebook or on the reference cards. But... Let's do the team battle and we'll play it out properly. Hopefully we don't get a spawn right there. Otherwise I'll just ignore it. So Orphan will reset. We will then, that'll be the first thing that we do this turn. So we get a face down card at four. And then a face down card at the location of the hero. So that really sort of screws up my plan. Let's see what we have here, but you know, we can make it 
make it work as well. So Cram will go next. He'll move and reveal a card. So it's luckily for us, it's still a strong enemy. So, and you notice after victorious battle, you may move one top face up creature to a location where a hero is standing. Now, my options to defeat this are, and we'll move this as it's been played. I could play Thorns 8, and if I'd required a willpower, willpower would increase my strength. That'd be a total of nine. Let me defeat this Scrawl Shaman. That is not the case. So no point in me playing a big attack. I've got two other characters that can help me at this location. So we don't necessarily want to waste any of their strong abilities. Let's see what we have. So we've got a total attack of six. So why don't we do this? What I'll do is I'm going to play Thorns for attack. I'm going to willpower. Cram will actually assist this time with five. So he plays this card, meaning we lose both cards at this point. And then we're able to defeat a scroll Shaman. And that's how you do team combat. So. We've gone through it. We've taught you how to play the Liberation of Rietberg. You got a partial playthrough. Now keep it right here as Julie and I will be coming back at you with our review of the game. The Liberation of Rietberg, a game set in the world of Andor. Now, just to clarify, it does not play like a Legends of Andor game, but you do have elements like willpower and familiar characters. So if you like the setting, you like the lore, you're gonna get some of that in this game. What did you think of it? Uh, so I, I didn't, I haven't played any of the other games, so I didn't really have anything to base it on, but I was, uh, I was looking forward. You've, you've had some good things to say about, uh, this, this world. Yes. Sammy G and I actually started, uh, the channel with Andrew being one of our first reviews. So I've been away for quite a while, still haven't finished the third game, but, uh, who knows, maybe this will inspire Julie and, uh, in our free time, cause we're getting rather busy, we'll slowly get caught up so we can get that third game reviewed. Uh, so I try. I tend to try to get uh, try out the female characters to see if they're built as strongly or uh, as uh, badass as the as the other ones. So well, one interesting point that I want to just uh, mention in the actual Andor games, cards are reversible, so you can decide to play female or male. But they do have their own actual like main character or the main version of them. And uh, you were playing Chatta, who was the archer. Who else were you playing? I also played the woman. Well, I can't remember their names. I'm, that's your strong suit. Uh, the woman who has uh, she has her spells, her books. Uh, Yara. Okay, if you say so. I also played a dwarf. I tend to really like dwarf characters because they tend to hit hard. Yeah, Cram, I believe. I'm not 100% sure. So... Um, in this case, actually, the two women were more fun to play than uh, the dwarf. I'm surprised. Normally, I, I tend to keep the dwarf characters because they, they hit harder. But uh, Dwarves and Wookiees. Yes, dwarves and Wookiees. <laughs> uh, but the two women played differently, but they were a lot of fun. Uh, I like the... In both cases, there's... Um, there's an ability with, with Chata to get the, the quills to pick up uh, quills to be able to hit harder. If quivers. You, quivers, sorry. <laughs> quills, quivers. Uh, have, have you ever seen an archer, like, Pulling quills, like, you know, like pen and ink quills and shooting them. It's a quiver. Quiver. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so it was fun to, to be able to, to have that attack if you want to, but she's not unidimensional that way. She has other things that she can do, and I felt like she had a lot to contribute in the game when, when I was playing with her. Um, uh, Yara, I think you yes. said her name was, for the, the spells. That was fun, too, because... Um, you can use the spells to do different things. So you can use them on attack, like you can use them for other things. And I really liked her ability to uh, to check out the uh, the task because that saved us some time. Sometimes the task oh, is, is really just too hard to do. So that saved us, I think. Uh, we barely won that game. And I think if we hadn't had that opportunity, we probably wouldn't have made it. Or as, I, as I almost interrupted, I was saying, you saying, no, you definitely really saved us. Like, you didn't, it wasn't like helped, it saved the game because some of the tasks were under like 
10 encounter cards that we had to go through. And by the fact that he revealed the ones that were just a complete waste of time, we weren't well set up, it let us focus on the ones that uh, we were able to complete. And then, uh, did you want to talk about Cram the Dwarf at all, or not really? It, he's okay. I mean, he has a he he has an axe that you can power up. Um, but I kind of found that with him, at least with the way we were playing, uh, it we really didn't want to power him up because we needed uh, we need our trophy case the way it was based on the tasks that we had. Yeah. Um, so that kind of hinders him a little bit, and I felt... I don't think so. I think it's random, though, but you're, you're definitely right that well, in I'd, certain games, he can be very... I definitely annoying. had more access to quivers than I had access to gold, let's yes. say. But there's also a limited amount of times you can power, power him up. But you were right. The Most of the games that we played, our pile of gold was a lot smaller than our pile of all the other creatures that we had uh, accumulated, well, defeated through the course of the game. Yep. Now, I played the other three characters who are, I believe it's Storm, who is your, your other, like, probably the most standout one, along with uh, Chada, who is really sort of your straightforward leadership fighter character. He's a, he's a well-rounded character, and he's able to gather willpower, which lets him do some big, strong attacks. Not like Cram, who starts out with the big axe and can essentially take out a troll uh, by himself. But uh, as Julie pointed out, the... Uh, the ability to do different things is very important because you're not always fighting or you don't always need a lot of strength. Sometimes it's going through the encounter cards and then to uh, make sure that you're on the right path, that you'll be able to get to that task or you'll need to do something else. Maybe you want to just discard an encounter card, which he's also good at doing as well. I got to play as Oren, the, uh, the Wolf Hunter character, which is cool because he had four cards and that was something that actually came into play uh, fairly... Uh, Really early on in that first play, what, actually. What character you play with a character that had the um, the water spirit? Yeah. Well, I think it's like it's a like Keela or Keely. I I know it starts with a K. I'm drawing complete blank on it. And she played very differently. I'd say I I didn't love the character. I felt that getting the water spirit into play and moving them around is fairly difficult. Now, one of the neat things about the water spirit is once it's in play, it stays in a specific place. And while we did have some problem spots on the board because Iara revealed that the tasks were ones that we would probably not be able to complete. I wasn't able to say just play the water spirit, put them in that location, and then uh, let that boost everyone's attacks. Really what I did like about all the characters though is that they all felt different. The game is highly asymmetrical and everyone sort of fits their archetype very well, but it always brings something a little different to every game and we collectively got to play as all of the different uh, characters. So while well, you have my character Thorn, who's like sort of the leader, willpower type, Oren's the wolf hunter, so he's got a little bit more versatility, a little bit more abilities to potentially move some characters or even attack and move, which is something I really like. And then uh, Keela or Keely, sorry, is basically more of a support character who can boost the stats of a lot of characters with her water spirit. And it's really fun. And I got to say, the game plays really fast. And I think that's one of the things I like. I was about to say, that's one of the things I like about the game. If you were to ask, you know, what, what do I like? Yes, there's some flavor and some text. And, you know, I enjoy the, the, the setting of this game. Oh, we, I just want to interrupt slightly. There's a lot of flavor text, especially on the monster cards. We ignored all the flavor text. Just because, well, it's cool and it's thematic and it works with the world of Andor. Playing this slimmed down, quick version of the game... I don't think either one of us felt like we really needed to dive into it. Now, it's not a critique. It's just something that I don't think enhanced the game experience No, but what I mean is, I mean, there's still the different characters and there's still the different, uh, you know, the different monsters have different uh, things that they do as well. And, and it's Oh, you just, mean their, uh, their abilities? Like yes. you could have three of the same monster, but none of them have the same abilities exactly. when you defeat them. And they all, like, the, the troll does something different. And, and in any case, that's what I enjoyed. And I, I felt that the art was, was fun as well. Uh, but I think the thing I like the most is it's a fun game, it's fun to play, and it's fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think right now for where we are in our lives, we need a game that we can put out on the table that doesn't take, you know, an entire game table, <laughs> uh, but also uh, that is easy to, you know, put up and tear down and can play relatively quickly. Well, we can put out one that takes up the whole table. It just means that it's going to take a little bit longer for us to, to get through it. Yeah. I, I have one that I've been working on that's been there for Far longer than I thought it would be. We, we have many <laughs> tables, and there are games on a lot of tables. 
Yes. Now, uh, I have to agree with Julie. I really like the, the speed of the game. I like the puzzle nature of the game. Uh, a lot of people say that Legends of Andor is more of a cooperative puzzle than anything else, and I think that that really comes through even more with this, where you do have an adventure aspect. In the original games, this is more of a puzzle-solving game, and for those of you that have watched the channel, you may be wondering why we didn't enjoy Heroes of Terranoth, and while I did like that game, I liked the leveling up of it, I felt that because we could die, we could be attacked, it wasn't as much fun, whereas this has some similar aspects in terms of if you're set card of hands, play your cards, pick up your cards, but because we're not dying, we're just focusing on solving the puzzle, I felt that it was just more fun, and it just plays easier, feels a little bit easier to set up, and there's also some variable difficulty. So we haven't had any severely difficult plays of the game. I'd say that our second play was when we were most challenged. Our first play, we fluked out some incredibly <laughs> similar tasks. We beat the game in one round. I think that game took us maybe 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. But we were playing on easy, so we did a first game setup as I was teaching the game to Julie. The moment we did not do that, it becomes a lot harder, and I don't think that that situation would ever occur with a standard two, three, or four player setup. Yep. And I think that really resumes my thoughts on the game. It's fun. It's thematic. I like the art, like Julie says. It's definitely a game set in the world of Andor, and something that you can play easily with, uh, with, with younger players. I'd say you can even go a little bit below a 10 if you so choose, because the game plays that quick. So... Even if they are struggling or it takes you a little bit longer, it's not the kind of game that a kid's gonna have in front of them for a long time that they may find you know, frustrating or boring. So definitely something that I think uh, we both enjoy and probably gonna be sticking around in our collection like the other Andor games. Mm -hmm. Anything negative to add about it? Uh, well, the negatives, I think I kind of highlighted it is that the game isn't uh, overly challenging. And uh, I will say a negative is the storage box. I mean, the board's nice. But I would have liked to have seen something like even thinner or, I don't know, I, I just feel like for the amount of air that's in this box, I could be using the space to store other games. So if you're an avid gamer like us, that might be a considerable negative for you. If you're a regular gamer, well, no problem. It'll fit nice in your collection. So what do you rate the game? It's going to get a seven for me. No, and I agree, agree with you. It's a seven. That's why we didn't have too many negatives to say about it. I, I think we both agree that it fits the niche exactly. Adventure, puzzle game, plays in under an hour. And I think that's the most that we can say about it. And price point. It is not overly expensive. So that's another reason why I don't have anything too negative. If you watch the channel, you notice that if I pay a lot more for a game and there's a couple aspects I really don't like. You have higher expectations. Higher expectations of, of component quality and other things like that. You're 100% right. So what time is it now, Julie? It's time to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell to be notified when we have new content for you. Also down below in the video description, you will find links to all of our social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you'd like to see pictures of Julie and I playing the liberation of Riedberg, you can find them there them there <laughs> also popping up in front of me you're going to see links to some of our previously released content we'll have a link that'll take you to our most recently released video and the link over here will take you back to our long time review it won't it unfortunately won't be julie on there it will be sammy g as we review the legends of andor so now what time is it that's time to grab our drinks grab our best friend and fellow adventurer we're gonna keep playing games. We're gonna keep playing games. So maybe we'll get to Andor maybe. eventually.